All right, welcome everyone to our MS Translate interview, um, continuing on with our coverage of the American Academy of Neurology conference that's recently been held in Vancouver, Canada. Today, we're very thankful to be joined by Dr. Lee Charvet. Um, Dr. Charvet is a researcher at the NYU Langone Comprehensive MS Care Center. Um, and Dr. Charvet had a number of presentations that she was involved in that were presented at the AN conference, and she's been kind enough to join us very early in the morning in New York now um, to talk to us about those projects. So, Dr. Chavez, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I wonder Hi. if you'd mind starting just by giving us a little bit of an, an introduction to you and, and how you've gotten into this field and, and the work that you're doing it. Sure. So, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist by training and have um, had long standing interest in MS. Um, starting out just with my clinical work over 20 years ago, and very interested to uh, merge research, uh, so very interested in the symptom of cognitive impairment, uh, especially because it's such a major problem in living for so many individuals with MS, and there's really no available treatment or effective treatment that's consistently effective, at least, for, for many people. So, yeah, I think that was one of the things that caught my attention um, when I was looking through the, the abstracts of the conference is that you have a number of presentations that are looking at um, cognitive function in people with MS and how that can be um, impacted and improved. Um, and, and as you say, cognitive function is one of those symptoms that's, that's very common amongst people with MS, but what there's at, at the moment really no treatment that can, that can help improve. So there's a number of different presentations that we're going to talk about, but we might just talk about a couple um, very briefly to begin with. So one of the presentations... Um, that you're involved in um, was regarding a telehealth um, mindfulness meditation project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So um, mindfulness meditation is a really powerful tool to reduce stress, and it's something that's accessible. So um, almost anybody can can learn the, the simple techniques and practice it. So you know, it, it's like the tagline, you know, um, a few minutes to learn and a lifetime to master. So it's practice over and over. And uh, we were interested, to, so I have a long-standing issue in stress and how stress influences illness and um, can just improve quality of life if you reduce stress. And so we came to mindfulness in that way and we were interested in how it affected symptoms. So this, the severity and intensity of symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. And so one of the problems, which is kind of a, a theme throughout our work, is, is trying to deliver treatments to be accessible to people living with MS um, outside of the lab. So it's, we're here in New York City, but almost anywhere, um, it, it's, it's a real obstacle for people to come into clinic weekly or especially every day if we're doing something else, some kind of intent, more intense remediation. And so we're really interested to use technology to deliver these treatments to people outside of the clinic. And so uh, this is where we took a standard mindfulness program, which has been established, and um, converted it to a telemedicine type of, of um, platform. And so basically here we just used um, the telephone and group conferences. And so we took, um, so mindfulness is, involves um, group learnings together and then group meditation and then individual practice. And so we mm -hmm. took the group part and the instruction uh, and put it onto a telemedicine platform. And in that study, uh, it was very interesting in that um, this was a really cool way to reach people. So the participants really enjoyed being able to learn about mindfulness and be tied into a program um, in, in a much more convenient, feasible way. And we also saw significant benefit with um, uh, the SDMT, or, which is a measure of... Uh, cognitive processing speed. So it seemed to help a little bit, and that's consistent with findings in the literature that um, probably because it's reducing stress, it just helps uh, dial down the intensity of symptoms. So we would think about it not only for cognitive impairment, but for stress and fatigue, and, I'm sorry, for fatigue and depression as well, um, okay. some of those symptoms. That's fantastic. And, and as you say, I mean, one of the difficulties that people with MS can face, especially towards those more advanced stages, is having to travel somewhere to get these sort of therapies can be really difficult. So being able to deliver it um, via that telemedicine platform um, and seeing the results you've seen is, is really interesting and, and fantastic. 
Um, so one of the other studies that, that you presented or that you were involved in the presentation was looking at um, a marker of cognitive function in paediatric MS and looking at impaired olfactory function. Can you talk to us a little bit about, about that study? Sure. So um, under the umbrella of our um, focus, we're trying to find measures that are the most sensitive to MS at its uh, cognitive involvement in MS at its earliest point. It's ultimately much easier to prevent a decline than it is to repair um, or remediate um, impairment once it's occurred. And so that's kind of the end goal is to try to predict who's at risk for impairment. And then, then that's where our interventions, I think, will ultimately be most effective. And so there's a lot of interesting work in um, olfactory functioning or um, so smell identification. So these are just scratch and sniff tests. So that's actually appealing in that these are very easy to, to administer. Patients enjoy them. Um, so it's a low stress assessment that um, that's very friendly for for routine assessment and olfactory identification or smell identification has been a powerful um, early detector for cognitive impairment, both the presence of cognitive impairment and especially the risk for future cognitive impairment in other disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and some others. And so we were interested. Uh, to see if that um, smell detection also might be sensitive in MS. So there's been a study, or I think maybe a few studies, that have shown that in adults with MS, smell does um, correspond to the degree of cognitive impairment. So olfactory identification is effective in, in at least corresponding to cognitive impairment in adults. But with our pediatric patients, these are the patients that have the earliest onset of MS, mm -hmm. um, and so we extended the assessment to these patients. And we also, we've, so in the study as well, we found, just as with the adults, that there is an impaired, um, a relative impairment. So when we call it impairment, it's not necessarily impaired, but it's a relative weakness and, uh, for smell identification. But importantly, that that was also corresponding to cognitive functioning in the pediatric sample. So this is, um, so... We have the appeal of this type of test and, and what it may mean, and also it may be a predictive window into future risk for decline, and that that's corresponding even in this young sample that really has no truly measurable cognitive deficits at this point, um, but it's corresponding with cognitive performance. Okay. So yeah. that is to be assigned to um, the, continue to evaluate this measure and what it might mean specifically for use of MS across the lifespan. Okay. And I mean, I, I think one of the real advantages of using um, or looking into pediatric MS is we get people at that very early stage when we're looking at what are the actual effects of MS and not necessarily the effects of having this long-standing inflammatory condition that we may be looking at when we're looking at adults. Do you have any sort of idea as to what may be causing the link between impaired olfactory function and the cognitive decline? Is it is it site of lesions? amount of lesions? Right, so um, there's really no, no, it's really not known in any of these but, disorders. Um, it's probably not the site of lesion. It's, of, of the theories, I, I think that the olfactory system in general is just uh, very sensitive. The neurons there are, mm -hmm. are relatively amyelinated and they, it's just um, a, a symptom of brain health overall. So it's just a sensitive part of the brain so that if there is global decline in brain health for whatever disease process is happening, that olfactory functioning is going to be an early um, indicator. Of okay. 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 Fantastic. Um, so another study that we actually um, published a short article on during the conference um, and one that I think has gained a, a little bit of media attention um, already, it was looking at a, adaptive computer-based training to help improve cognitive function. Right. Yeah, so this is a study that we're really excited about. Um, it's a large clinical trial, so it's controlled, randomized, uh, with 135 patients. And here, what we studied was, um, so these programs are coming out with technology allowing um, delivery of cognitive remediation through a web-based platform. 
And what that allows are features that have never been able to be provided through one-on-one -on -one working with a clinician. So a web-based platform can provide rapid learning trials, so really optimizing and driving learning. And in addition, they adapt in real time to how the user is performing. So if, if I go a little bit slower, it'll slow down, or a little bit faster, it'll speed up. And that really drives learning because it maintains my engagement um, in the program. And so, so there's, these programs are coming out, and we really wanted to know if they would be helpful specifically for use in MS. And then a, a real advantage of the programs, because they're web-based, is that they can be remotely accessed. They can be accessed from home. And so in this trial, we did what, a remotely supervised protocol. So it's different than just uh, having people play and report back, but we actually monitored them in real time. And we used a comparative program that were ordinary computer games just um, that might have face validity as something that we all would think would be cognitively enhancing or helpful. Uh, so like if you think word searches and crossword puzzles and just games like that, but um, I didn't have any of these adaptive features or, or, or advanced designs that the, the target program did, which was Posit Sciences uh, Brain HQ developed for research purposes for us. So we picked the games that, or the training exercises that we thought would be most um, targeted towards MS specific deficits. So we randomized participants. They all had um, some degree of cognitive impairment, and uh, we randomized them to put to train in either that adaptive program or the control condition for 12 weeks. So we were targeting five days a week, an hour a day for 12 weeks, so target of 60 hours of uh, training. And we did a um, neuropsychological assessment at baseline, and then we did that at the study end after 12 weeks. And here we found the first very exciting to us that it was really feasible. This is a really doable type of um, delivery of cognitive remediation. So participants really liked it. It was a rapidly enrolling trial. We rapidly recruited, um, uh, um, you know, it really speaks to how much of a need there is for treatment of cognitive impairment because so many people wanted to participate in the trial. And um, we had very high compliance in both conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so it was able to follow the procedures. We found actually that that comparison, the control condition, was played more often than, than the adaptive condition. And, and our thought is probably because it was easier. Um, it's really a workout to do mm -hmm. the, the training condition. But that being said, the training condition led to significantly greater gains, that, that adaptive um, targeted program, led to significantly greater gains in cognitive functioning. Um, so we used a composite of um, cognitive tests that are sensitive in MS. And that average we looked at at baseline and then at study end. So they had significantly greater gains than the comparison group um, okay. by study end. And also within that condition, the more they played, the higher the gain they had. So it was a real indicator, both that, again, we could reach these, reach people this way and provide uh, cognitive remediation through this platform, and that these features in this type of program may work specifically in MS. Um, so just we're really excited about this and, and looking forward to um, following up to find out who's going to benefit and how we can really maximize that benefit and, and some of the parameters so we can give some real-world recommendations on what people could be doing to be most helpful. Okay. That's really interesting because I think, I mean, we, we often say when it's we're doing physical training um, and be this, um, you know, or people in the in the public or people with MS, and we've done features before on ways that we can do physical therapy to help um, improve muscle function and things like that. That you always look at doing things where you increase resistance and build up that that sort of muscle strength. And it, it sounds like what you're saying is that the brain is no different. If we're really going to train the brain and get those sort of benefits, we need to keep increasing, increasing. It's not just a matter of doing the same sort of tasks over and over. Right. We use that exercise analogy all the time, um, and and it definitely you know um, seems to be applicable here. And, and 